Hey, Mother Nature is not cooperating too well today. Uh, we'd hope to be able to go over to the Red Rock House to have this outside, but I don't think any of you want to get that wet. So, my name is Natalie Frorup, and I have been working with the Historical Society for the past 14 years. I like to tell people I pick, quit my paying job to work for nothing, uh, but it's a really work well. So, um, we are very honored to be able to help um, this wonderful house moved on. Um, it is something that we've grown about for a long time. So, um, before I get any more emotional, Dave Swenson is a retired pastor, and he's one of our wonderful volunteers, so he can give a little invitation. Let us pray. Good and gracious God, we give you thanks for this time of fellowship and this meal that you so graciously provided and the loving hands that prepared all that food. And now, Almighty God, we ask that you be with us today as we dedicate this Red Cross house. As we do, we remember the hundreds of victims who died in the horrific fire and those who died in the days and weeks in the aftermath. Today we honor those who survived and lived to tell their stories. We give thanks for the generosity and the courage of the people who became the rebuilders of all this. We thank Alfred and Jensina Johnson and their children and their family for the generosity in sharing this house for the many who come to experience what happened in October of 1918. Now, Lord, we ask that uh, all these things in your son's name, and as Natalie said, Lord, we've had enough rain. Amen. <laughs> Jim Eckman, if he'd started the arc yet, to, uh, but he, he's delaying it. So, Betty Leah will now read a poem. Flames roared in the wind, October 12, 1918. Unfortunately, we do not know the author of this poem. Shot through with flaming red spikes, the air blue with smoke, was a grimy alien in the murky sky, hot and heavy, difficult to breathe. Drought sucked moisture all summer, turning woods and land into paper mache, prized for the torch of October, primed for the torch of October. The Brookston train arrived, its weary refugees refused to stay in Cloquet, too close to the fire. When flames roared in the wind, others knew their terror. Panic crowds filled the town, fleeing all they knew. Brightly illuminated stores, ready for Saturday night shoppers, stood rear guard. As the last people left Cloquet, a ghost town ready to be consumed. The lumber yard gave up its future, houses, stores, and sheds. Smoke billowed in dense clouds, swirling to mask the road. Hot trees exploded, their bark popped like corn. Showered the world, the road with flaming kernels. Fence posts lighting the path to Hades. Train whistles shrieked, humming, summoning all who could crowd the flat cars and coaches, leaving others trapped in that death blaze creeping along until on a high trestle in Jay Cook Park, it stopped. 
fire, licking from deep gullies, turned rails to blistering threads, unsafe for its terrified cargo. The only sound, the hissing of water cooling the rails. Cautiously, the engine crawled until a sign was reached. A tall, flaxen-haired girl, dressed only in flower sacks, clutched two white kid high-button shoes filled with love letters from France, the only article she was able to save. A touring car fled the flames filled with frantic riders until the road ended too soon. Children tumbled out against a wall of light, clinging to each other. Night came in name only. The fury continued, advancing toward them. Exhausted and sooty, they trudged and found an escape from their nightmare. Hair streaming out behind her, Mamie, a goddess of the night, her chariot, a long potato wagon, took reins into strong hands, spurring horses through fire and wind, until at last she thundered to safety. The parents, Coibisto, fought the firestorm, advancing towards their root cellar, its contents their whole life. Morning revealed their seven children still forever. Others perished in lakes and streams, arm pointing to the lake. The leader implored his followers to hurry and remain a blackened arrow never released. Through it all, the sounds, agonized shrieks of trapped animals, blood curdling cries of doomed humans, crashing of trees, howling of the wind, and fire crackling and raging. And then it was Sunday. Light and warmth filtered through a sky made of smoke. Like a miracle, Sunday dawned, and the morning began. Next, Steve Bondo, who is a resident uh, historian and archaeologist, is going to talk about the history of the Red Cross. Thanks, Natalie. Uh, that's a hard one to follow up. Thanks, Betty. Uh, my name is Stephen Blondo. As uh, pointed out, I'm a resident of Split Rock Township. Uh, I work as an archaeologist and a historian. Uh, thanks for having me here today. So we uh, finally have a Red Cross fire shack at the museum. I have been mesmerized by these buildings uh, since I moved up here about 10 years ago. Um, seeing them in my neighborhood, seeing them around town, just uh, wanting to jump out and measure every single one of them to see is it really a Red Cross fire shack. Uh, the history of the shacks is pretty straightforward and pretty well known. After the devastating fires of 1918, survivors could pr prove their uh, need by filling out a bunch of paperwork and apply for assistance to replace a home, lost home. The Red Cross offered plans and instructions with building materials for one of two sized buildings, a 12 by 16 for small families or a 12 foot by 20 foot for larger families. There's no real definition of smaller and larger as far as we've found. So uh, my family of five is probably smaller and I don't know how long those kids would last in a 12 by 16. <laughs> Or me. Uh, after the fires, the combination of a mild October and November and a fast-moving Red Cross recovery effort allowed for an overall quick rebuilding process. According to Francis Carroll in the Fires of Autumn, the supplies were available by November or October or November, and a newspaper account of the time reported that by November 15th, more than 250 shelters had been constructed in Cloquet, and that by December, most of those that had returned to the burned-out area were living in some kind of shelter of their own. In the end, the fire commission spent over $1.3 million on immediate relief. 
Reading through some of the first-hand accounts that we've recorded over the last 100 years, we hear some common threads about fire shacks. I had never really read the accounts of the fire uh, survivors um, looking for fire shack information until, um, until now, and uh, they're very interesting, just kind of snippets here and there. Um, but here's a compilation of some of these stories. Uh, one, one survivor recalled, as my family stayed at a neighboring farm, there was no room there for me, so I was on my own to find shelter as best I could. Later, my parents obtained enough lumber from the Red Cross to construct a long, one-room building. This was partitioned off so that half of it was for living quarters, and the other half was to shelter the cattle from the upcoming winter weather. The fall of 1918, as I said before, saw frantic building after the fires. Uh, a, a recollection says, it was the funniest thing. It was just rat-a-tat-tat, way up until 10 o'clock at night, and again in the morning, building those shacks. We had a beautiful fall after that fire. I said to someone, the Lord is surely with us after the fire. The houses were small. Uh, one uh, survivor uh, recollection says, the new house wasn't any more as big as the old house, but we were happy with it. And the process of assistance and building was slow. Later, a small frame house was built. Some Red Cross assistance was finally made available in March 1920. Rebuilding was a slow process with his very limited resources, says one survivor about a relative. Once finished, winter weather was a challenge. So uh, uh, this is uh, something to keep in mind when you go out to visit the, the Red Cross shack. Uh, a, a story says, my grandparents obtained lumber from the sawmills with which to build shacks. The uncured lumber was covered with tar paper to keep the wind out. There was no insulation. The sole means of heat was a wood stove. Lighting was provided by kerosene lamps. Sanitary facilities consisted of a crude privy situated in the backyard. They had no running water. Grandpa obtained water from a well in the ruins of my great-grandfather's basement. As winter wore on, the uncured lumber began to shrink and cracks appeared in every wall. Blankets were hung in front of the windows and doors in an attempt to keep out the drafts. The cold winters echoed here in another story. I sure remember living in our two-room shack, the small size that we divided into a bedroom and a kitchen. It had no foundation, so the wood floor was laid right on the earth. There was no insulation in the walls or the ceiling. That floor was so cold on my feet in the winter, and we had to walk down the alley to the outhouse. We had a dog and a cat. The only heat from was from a kitchen stove, and my dad had to get up many times during the night to keep the fire going. We got a load of wood every spring. It was still green, and it was my job to stack it so it would be dry by fall. The four of us lived in that shack until 1924, when dad built a new house. But the survivors of the fire made it through. One says, it was like a, it was a cold, long winter, but by the grace of God, we survived, and now it seems like some horrible dream. And rebuilding was difficult, echoed here. Sometime next spring, we returned to the farm and father put up a temporary building, no doubt one of the so-called Red Cross shacks, and then started the difficult task of rebuilding. Survivors started from scratch. One says, like all of our other victims, having no other choice, we began to build shelters for families and livestock and started all over again from nothing. But not all the stories focus on what wasn't or what was taking so long. Many others reflect on the positives. For example, in discussing working together as a community, a survivor states, the Red Cross furnished lumber to build a four-room house and all the neighbors pitched in and helped to build. Another talks about surviving the disaster. Slowly but surely, we managed to start all over again like so many others. And we did manage to get a humble house put up out of Red Cross material and lived in this until 1921 when the present home was constructed. Reuniting families and the ability to return uh, to their homes is another common theme. Building material was furnished by the Red Cross. My uncle had a house ready by Christmas, and Dad lived with him and started his own house, which was ready for occupancy by the following Easter. This same house still stands and is occupied, like so many others, built at the same time. Our family was finally reunited, and a normal family life started anew. This Red Cross Fire Shack is an important addition to our museum. It's important to our telling of the, night, the fires of 1918 story, and it's important to our community. Its value is in what it represents. To me, it represents the resiliency of our Moose Lake area community. Survivors of the fire could have left, 
the area, and some did, but most returned and rebuilt their homes and their lives. This fire shack is a reminder to us that we really can overcome obstacles when we support each other and work together. Thank you. Then we have a surprise visitor here today. Uh, John Keith is a representative and a volunteer from the Red Cross, so um, he's going to speak next. Uh, hello, and uh, thanks for having me today. Um, uh, the surprise visit is just as much of a surprise for me as far as coming up and saying a few words. Um, but uh, on behalf of the American Red Cross uh, Duluth chapter, uh, we can't be thankful enough to the Johnson family for the donation of the home uh, and for all the time uh, financially. Uh, the people who donated their time, talents to getting this thing ready. It serves as a reminder, uh, much like was mentioned earlier, of the <coughs> not just re remembering those who perish in those horrific events and the families affected, but to also to all of those as a reminder who reached out to help in every way possible. Um, it, it serves, the home serves as a symbol, I feel, as a symbol of the resiliency, the compassion, the grit, and the overall character of all these great people in, that live throughout these small communities throughout northern Minnesota and northwest Wisconsin. It's a true testament to who they are as people, probably almost untouched in any other area in the United States as far as what we see. Too often we see, <clears throat> or oftentimes, we hear stories of the people who had their homes destroyed, being taken in by other families who were, were, were more fortunate. We find time and time again that these bonds that were created between those families, bonds of friends, are still alive today. These people, generations later, after the event, after that horrific event, that these families still come together and still our remain friends. So if anything positive would have been taken out of it, um, to see a true binding of communities, banding of good people. Uh, again, on behalf of the Red Cross, we thank you guys, again the Johnson family, and all who participated in that. So we thank you. Of the great grandson of Alfred and Jensina Johnson. I just want to say a few words, Ken. Hello. I'm just going to touch a little bit on the history of uh, the house and my family with it. Um, my grandparents, great grandparents, Alfred and Jensina, were here about 10 years when the fire went through. And six boys. My grandfather was the next to the youngest. He was 10 years old when the fire went through. And, um, we were in the process of building the house that mom and dad currently live in. And I read somewhere in a letter that uh, the day of the fire is the day they finish the basement. And uh, so but anyhow, when the fire came through, Alfred and Jensina and their boys, I think they gathered what they could and they ran to the next door neighbors to plug the farm because they had plowed fields. And uh, that's how they survived the fire. 
And uh, after that, when they got the house, I didn't realize this so recently, but all six of those boys are still home. So there were eight people that were in that house for a while. So, the house, the current house, was finished in 1922. And uh, in 1935, Alfred and Jensina sold the farm to my grandparents, you know, Gladys, in which Alfred and Jensina moved back into the Red Cross house. And uh, we actually have that contract. And in that contract is that they will have access to the big house it's called, for bathing and uh, storing potatoes and stuff. Like that. <laughs> and uh, Alfred passed away in 1939. And uh, up until then, uh, 1963, my grandfather sold the farm. Grandpa and grandma sold the farm. And, uh, I think Jen Cena lived in that house until, I'm guessing, the late 50s. She went into a nursing home, but I'm not sure of the exact date. But you know, Grandpa sold the farm in 63. He went into foreclosure, and Mom and Dad bought it back in 1970. And, uh, we moved there in 1976. And uh, I guess to me, for most of my life, that was just another little house on the farm. You know? But when I was a kid, I remember that house sat right on the ground. Uh, it was starting to come apart, and Dad poured a foundation and was about 100 feet away. And uh, Dean Larson, Jack Lodge, and Dad up their tractors to that house and they pulled it up on that foundation. And that's probably why it's still around today. So, uh, the spring of 17, the foundation started collapsing, <coughs> excuse me, and uh, we figured, well, something's got to be done with the house, but we're going to lose it. So we decided to offer it to uh, the Sparkle Society. Mm -hmm. We're just, all of us, even our relatives we've been communicating with in the West Coast, are just tickle pink that you guys got. We're glad. So, that's all we got. We're going to have a poem uh, read by Steve Olson. It's called Fires of Autumn. And this poem was written by one of our Moose Lake eighth graders back in, um, I think, in the 90s, Julie Averkus. You'll probably recognize that name. for the 80th anniversary, so that was like in 1998. And Ken was talking about pulling the house up on the slab with them, with their tractors. It reminded me of us pushing it up the hill with a bulldozer to get it up on the slab where it is now. And I was fortunate enough to know Ken as an electrician at Craver Electric who came in all the time to buy stuff, and he's a great guy. Wished he could be here today. Winds of Autumn. One fall day, the wind started to blow. Sparks threw to flame and the sky was aglow. They were the worst fires that many had seen on that fateful day of October 12, 1918. The weather was fair throughout the morning, but the fires swept through quickly without such warning. The people ran to stay alive with hopes that everyone would survive. The smoke made the visibility low, but there was no time to go slow. Many Monotees had to swerve when they got to Dead Man's Curve. Others filed into Moose Lake, knowing that their lives were at stake. As the air around them grew hotter, people in cars went into the water. Trains were loaded with people too. Their engines were started in a way they flew. All the victims had many fears. 
some showed emotion with their tears. Once the fires died down to a smolder, the victims knew it would get much colder. They had no shelter, no clothes or food, which put them in a somber mood. Supplies were given by the Red Cross to help the victims lessen their loss. The people built shacks as fast as they could, using all the available wood. The railroads took most of the blame for causing terror, fire, and flames. The monument stands to honor the lives that were lost in the fire that had such a high cost. Eighty years have come and gone so fast. We always remember the past on that fateful day so long ago when the winds of autumn began to blow. Next, I'm going to ask Carl and Manny Poole to come up and speak. Uh, Carl and John have been great supporters of this project. And the three dollars are here. I'm just so happy to be here with all of you today. Natalie uh, sent me an email a couple weeks ago and said, would you like to would you be willing to make a few remarks at the event? And I said I would be happy to. So shortly after that, I made my list of the things I'm grateful for today. And so much of it has already been covered. I'm grateful for the Johnson family and their, their sense of history, the importance of this house for their generosity in donating the Red Cross home. It could have easily stayed on their property for many years. So thank you, Johnson family. I'm grateful. I'm grateful for Natalie and her dedication to this Moose Lake Area Historical Society, to this building, to the displays, for all of her hard work. Thank you so much, Natalie. I'm grateful to the board, the past boards, the present board, and the volunteers who live in this area. Uh, and all of their hard work, I know they worked hard to prepare the home for today, but they're always here, and they're always working and covering the historical society. So I'm grateful for all the volunteers. And I'm grateful for our father, Edward Manny, girl's grandfather, and that he was able to fulfill a dream. To, he had all of the oral histories captured from this area, and he fulfilled the dream of being able to publish them. And I have often felt he left such a legacy for all of you families so that it can, those stories can be passed on to children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren. So I'm so grateful that he lived to be able to fill that dream that our great uncle John Manny originally started. The book is available in the Historical Society. To And I'm grateful to the author, Kurt Brown, and his wonderful book, 1918. And for those of you who may not have had an opportunity to read it, I highly recommend it. I have it highlighted, I have it sitting on my stand by my recliner, and I refer to it a number of times. And he did such a remarkable job of tying together that whole year of 1918. The forest fires of 1918, the flu epidemic, and the impact of World War I. And he covers many areas of the state with such clarity. So I am grateful to him for that book. And I am also grateful, and I have this on my list, for the Red Cross and the, all of the assistance that they provided in those many weeks following that horrible, horrible night. For the Red Cross, the materials, the donations, the food, clothing, these were, the majority of them were immigrants who had nothing to start with. 
and then what they did have, they lost. So I'm grateful for those 250 homes that have been referred to. And this is going to be such a wonderful example of that for so many people. And for the social workers who were in the area for many weeks assisting the family. So I'm grateful, so grateful to the Red Cross and all they did for our families. And last... <laughs> At last, I'm grateful that I was able to be here today to be, to be part of this. I'm not speaking for all of you, but many of us in this room as adult sons and daughters of the survivors are now a uh, few of us in our 80s. <laughs> not all, but we. And uh, we need to keep telling those stories. And Natalie said, would you say what the Red Cross House means to you? And I think it's going to be just such a teaching tool, such an educational tool for people who come to the Minnesota, to the Moose Lake Area Historical Society building. It will be there, it, it, it makes those stories come alive. So those of you who come after us need to keep telling those stories. We need to keep telling the stories. So oh, just thank you all. Um, Marilyn Schmidt also was very supportive of this project. And she wanted to say a few words, but her back was just extremely uh, painful. Uh, so she donated in memory of Glenn, who um, spent many, many hours getting this, the depot restored and ready to uh, turn into a museum. Next is Dan Reed about why his support is important. I inherited something from my mother. I have to take my glasses off to read. <laughs> I was first asked to talk about uh, why these buildings were called uh, shelters, shacks, homes. What does that all mean? Uh, what was called a Red Cross shack has such been called by many labels. Originally, the blueprints for the building and the service directive of the Red Cross called for a Red Cross shelter. The period after the big fire was a desperate one. Winter was coming. The period directly after the fire was ironically rainy and cold. Material was brought in by rail by the train loads. Meanwhile, every building material stockpile that had not been destroyed in the big fire became available to build temporary stores and homes for those that stayed. Some boards had not had time to season properly. In those conditions, the temporary housing built were just a shadow for most residents surviving of a larger finished home that they had lived in. It seemed very logical to call this temporary housing a shack. And as an addendum to this, don't think that everyone slept in the shack. Uh, many stories over the years centered around people uh, having the kids, some of them sleep in the sauna dressing room. There were many stories of uh, children sleeping in the hayloft of the barn. Much more comfortable than crammed into that attic over there. As times went on, many of these shacks, very much a home, were finished off and in many cases additions were put on, sometimes a second floor. The industriousness 
of the local people created a home to be proud of, with sometimes little resources available. But on a more important subject, I wanted to talk about the success of the facilities here at the Moose Lake Area Historical Society is quite evident. Starting with the salvaging of the Sioux Line Depot, the fires of the 1918 Museum and the Event Center creation has shown how focused and creative the membership here has been. It is a remarkable story. Just this year, the historical mural, a refurbishing of the Calvella church organ, pump organ, and this example of a red cross shack, just to name a few, have become a reality. Volunteers research area archives throughout the year, and work is done in many areas. Important work has yet to be completed. A kitchen for this event center needs to be completed, and it's a costly undertaking. Just that addition will make this event center and the museum more financially sustaining. The city of Moose Lake and the Masons have been a backbone for the very existence of this complex. Now the question is, what can you do? If you are not a member, become one. When you are considering organizations to support, support this one. It does good work. Each person involved in a small or large way makes a difference. This complex is a shining star for our area and needs every one of your support and the support of your families, your friends, your businesses. Thank you for your consideration. I have one more poem. Um, my mother in law's family was a fire survivor, and she had taken a little book and put all kinds of clippings in it. And in here, I found this uh, poem, uh, A Sand Stone's Man Tribute to Moose Lake. So Ross Anderson is going to be reading this. I have seen Moose Lake, the maid of the forest, on the beautiful Green Valley floor with the hills and meadows and woodlands and the village so fair on its shore. As we see it, when up north we are speeding up the road through the beautiful glen, with its glimmering, glittering water is a view not yet painted with a pan. It is a scene of great fascination, like a beautiful dream in the night, like the morning when daylight is breaking, with its surface so charmingly bright. Have you ever seen it like a mirror reflecting every grove, every hillside so steep, and the cottages gracefully resting like a mirage in the azure blue deep? We've seen you when quietly rowing round the shore with a line in my hand, heard your music when wavelets are playing on the beach with its pebbles and sand. Again in the late summer evening, on the day of the 4th of July, when the lake was a wonder of beauty with fireworks flashing in the sky. A drive on the lakeshore, what a pleasure, through the beautiful town all around, to the park which I hail as a treasure, where best comfort for camping are found. Your charm has, your charm has had great attraction to the people from far and near, how they gather in town on the lakeside for festival occasions so dear. Hear the cheers, see the waiting and splashing in the shallows by children galore. On the lake how the oar blades are flashing, 
from bolts, but of joy evermore. And the village, so proud you are standing, how you arose from the ashes again, from the fateful destruction by fire, with its horrors and sorrows and pain. I have listed quite a few thank yous in the program, uh, the Johnson family. Um, special thanks to Robin and Kim, uh, to John and Coral Bull, and to Marla Schmidt, um, to Chris Ramstad and his crew for moving the house. Um, I think it was over a, something like a two week period of time, he'd have a date. We have a snowstorm, I do remember what March and then early April were like here. It was the winter that never quit. Um, but we finally got it done. And then they got it here and it took them about three to four hours just to get them up that little incline over there. So um, they were very, very devoted. Um, last but not least, Corky Mackey and Pat Farrell have been working on some restoration. Karen Gretzfeld and Sandy Walter. Um, Ross Anderson and Steve Olson have been looking to get it clean. Um, there was a few years of uh, dust and dirt. <laughs> <laughs> it was interesting. Uh, committee members, Betty Leah, Dan Reed, Ross Anderson, Steve Olson, Dean Paulson, and myself. So uh, thank you to all of you. Um, last I also want to tell you on October 13th and 14th the weekend, um, we're having a lot of things going on here. On Saturday morning, there will be a bus tour of the Moose Lake area fire sites. It will be starting out of here, and then the first stop will be out at the monument. And that afternoon is the program. Um, Kurt Brown will be coming to speak about his, um, his book and the pump organ from the Summa Line in Kirko um, that is in the process of being restored will make its first concert that day. So that's pretty exciting. Um, anyway, it should be a really fun weekend. Huh? Sunday. Yeah, and on Sunday afternoon will be another bus tour and that one will be more in the outlying area. Um, so it will start more like in Kettle River and go uh, this Lip Rock, Calavella, etc. And then at 4 o'clock on Sunday is a concert up at the Moose Lake School by um, Prudence Johnson. She's a local um, vocalist who is really, really awesome. And in September is Dan Reed's play that he has written, um, The Women of 1918. What's the date, Dan? 22nd. 22nd of September. So we look forward to see you all again then. So thank you for coming. The house is open, and I will go be over there. Um, so if you want to venture out, I get wet, but I think what. the rain has stopped. Oh, OK. Oh. okay. okay. <laughs> 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 Mr. Potts. <laughs> 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 Yeah, but it was it was his idea. 
Well, that is, we've, we're so grateful, and it's really a feather in you our cap. You did a good thing, you. Kill. <laughs> yeah, you did. I think it's probably the only one that anybody has, you know, that we know is going to be reserved, you know. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I think we're looking at it. Yeah. 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 Yeah.